I want to go back into time today, about four centuries ago, to observe the invention of the telescope and the microscope, and how they basically allowed us to see the world differently. By utilizing these new creations, we were able to see aspects of the world that were previously unknown. As a result, it changed our entire understanding of the physical world. There's a similar revolution that's occurring today, in terms of the tools that are being used to analyze and manage data, the ability to harness mass amounts of data in the pursuit of understanding capital markets. Will likely change the way we study markets in the future, much like the microscope and telescope changed history. Welcome to the big trade. You are now listening to the big trade with Peter Pham, enlightening conversations for maximum market returns. Thanks for tuning in into the inaugural episode of the Big Trade. Overall, the premise of this show is very simple. It is a mastermind of some of my friends on Wall Street, authors, opinion leaders, and professors, with the objective to help you understand what's happening in the world around us. Hopefully, one can actually take some of these ideas. To implement that in both an investing and trading strategy, as you know, the world is becoming ever more so interconnected, and not everyone can know everything that is happening around this globe. Although many opportunities are developing, and as global citizens, we should try to take advantage of those opportunities in this free market. My name is Peter Pham. I'm an author, hedge fund manager, and passionate libertarian. As an author, I recently published a book called *The Big Trade: Simple Strategies for Maximum Market Returns*. Overall, the premise of the book is to use statistics and probabilities to understand the behavior of price. This is what a lot of the people refer to as. Algorithmic trading, which uses code to understand minute changes in the market, I actually implement this position and approach from a much more discretionary perspective, which allows you to look at markets in the long term. And you'll get to understand more about that as we get to know each other. As a hedge fund manager, I'm looking for growth and income in terms of the global marketplace. Looking for opportunities throughout the Americas, Europe, and Asia, primarily benchmark against the MSCI World Index. And as a passionate libertarian, I'm actually looking at the component of free markets and how they tend to work, and the influence that intervention from states and central banks have on markets and their ability to function. It's by understanding. All these dynamics that give you a very agnostic view of the markets, and I think that at the end of the day is what we should all strive to understand. We keep our views on politics and religion and and policies aside, and try to explore where the opportunities lie as an investor or a trader, so that we can implement and improve our lifestyle or various different. Things that interest us. So let's kick off the show by bringing in a gentleman that has a lot of connections throughout the financial industry. His name is Frank Curgio. He should be a really interesting first conversation with. And throughout the course of the next year, I happily like to bring in a lot more interesting people for us to have this dialogue with. And I hope it can be very enriching for you in terms of your life and your understanding of the world. So, without further ado, let's bring Frank on. Thanks, Frank. Maybe you can introduce yourself to the audience. Hey, Peter! Thank you so much for being on your podcast. My name is Frank Curzio. I have a podcast for ten years. It's called、uh, Wall Street Unplugged. 
could be fine on iTunes. I also have been following small caps for a very, very long time. My dad, who was a, a newsletter writer, uh, my late dad for all of his life, wrote a newsletter for 30 years. Wow. Uh, I worked for Jim Cramer for five years. I worked for Stansberry Research, which is the largest newsletter provider in the world for five years. And uh, just been in this industry for, for my whole life, analyzing stocks. And uh, it, it's pretty cool. I wouldn't choose another profession because I learn something new every day. So, yeah, enough about me. But uh, I ain't really talking about me. But, yeah, that's uh-huh. basically it and the podcast and newsletters and stuff like that. So right now you're, I'm fortunate enough to interview you as almost a free agent or an independent right now. Tell me about your experience working with Kramer and Stansberry for a few minutes. Well, well, Kramer was interesting. It's one of the best educations you could ever get. I'm sure people listen to this saying, you know, Kramer's crazy or they love him and they hate him. There, there's one thing for certain. I've interviewed people for 10 years. It includes uh, over a thousand market experts, mutual fund managers, hedge fund managers. I've never met anyone smarter than Jim Kramer who knows the markets, who can analyze something five years ago and remember it like, uh, you know, I could talk to him about it right now if I wanted to. Just a a brilliant mind, but you know, you see him on TV and people, you know, industry experts kind of make fun of him. But what he is tailoring himself to is to the individual investor. And he makes his shows entertaining. If he's talking about Kellogg's, he'll bring on cereal boxes. He'll dress up and make it entertaining because, and even with these podcasts, if we just said, buy Microsoft, it's got a lot of cash flow, it's a good company. I mean, people are just going to tune out. You're telling people that things that they already know, you want to make it as entertaining as possible. Working for him is real difficult, changes his mind a lot, but it was an amazing education because we used to have to analyze his research channels and, and someone who ran his research department. We used to analyze 2,000 stocks a, a year. So right. we had to know every stock, every industry, every CEO, the content. I was going out with, with, with market experts, dinner every night. I was on New York Stock Exchange, uh, ringing the bell with companies. I mean, the contact list is amazing. It's a great education that you couldn't get anyplace else. Uh, in the four or five years I worked there, I would say that's a 20-year education with the amount of stocks that we covered. Uh, Stansberry is a great organization as well. The largest newsletter provider, huge, huge company, and I just got exposure to, to so many different outlets and so many different people, and it was amazing just writing newsletters for them. And right now, I'm thinking about doing it myself, and just in a transition period right now, which is kind of really, really exciting. There's a lot of people that are reaching out that wanted to hire me, which is really cool, and I've been fortunate, but I'm just debating whether I want to go someplace else or actually do it myself. And you know, it's only been a month I've been a free agent, but I'm enjoying it, but I've been more busy this month than actually working for any company, so it's pretty cool. That's probably a great reflection on the power of markets when you're actually creating as much value as possible. There's going to be many different entities that want to work with you because of the impact that you've had on so many people. So that's probably a testament to what you're doing, uh, Frank. One question is regarding Porter. He seems to be a very brilliant guy himself. Like, What are your thoughts? Have you ever had that chance to have a one-on-one conversation with him about markets? And what did you learn from him as well? Yeah, absolutely. Porter's a great guy. I worked for him. He hired me uh, five years ago. And he, unfortunate for him, is his company, unfortunate for him, and I'm being selfish here, is his company just grew enormously. It's light out compared to any other industry. I mean, I don't know how to compare it. It's almost comparing Microsoft to all the small caps. I mean, they're like the Microsoft or the Apple of the newsletter right. industry. But it's good and bad for him personally because I think he's a great analyst, especially reading balance sheets. He was able to call Fannie and Freddie uh, and how they were going to go under years yeah. before anybody talked about it. Uh, GM as well. And I love those qualities about that. But that's one of the things that I think about when I run my own business, because I love the research end of it. I love writing about stocks. I love educating people. But when you own your own business and you're that successful, you have millions of other responsibilities. So do I want to be a research analyst and that's 90% of my business, or do I want to run my own company and it's 20, 30% of my business? So as you get bigger, unfortunately, it's more hard to write. It's more hard to, to, to write more newsletters, write about more stocks, which is you know, things I love about Porter, even Jim Kramer, too, where he has his show. He's writing like five times a day. He's got so much on his plate. Where I'd love to see Jim Kramer just be a head manager and cover like 20 stocks or 30 stocks, and his performance would be amazing. Unfortunately, both of those guys have so much on their plate. You know, I've been next to these guys as well. So for me, that's one of the things where it seems like it's easy. I've had a podcast for 10 years and I have a lot of subscribers, over 100,000 downloads a month from Phil Wall Street Unplugged. 
But when you start your own business, you have to realize that, okay, what you're really, really good at is just going to be a small part of the business, and then you start managing people and stuff like that. So I guess I'm selfish because I'd rather see Jim Cramer by himself managing a hedge fund, Porter writing a newsletter only and not managing people, and then you'd really get the best of them because there's so many other responsibilities that come off with, with running your own company. Exactly. I had the same conversation with the CEO at Montley Full, and it seemed as if previously he was an equity analyst, but eventually he started thinking about running a company, the scale and the operations. So sometimes you kind of get a little bit disconnected with that from what originally got you into the game and what made you really passionate about everything. But enough about your past, right? Let's talk about what's going on in the markets. We see a lot of volatility in oil prices. What do you think this means for investors and how can investors capitalize in on this trend going forward? I buy Exxon Mobil and Chevron here. I think those are the two big oil plays. A lot of people are trying to bottom fish here. You know, if I had this interview with you four weeks ago, I'd say buy Halliburton at 55 or 60 and buy like the oil services companies and they're taking over Baker Hughes and, right. and you can buy Schlumberger and stuff like that and Weatherford. But I can tell you, in the last three weeks since, you know, fast forward, the last three weeks that I've been a free agent, I've had two different people come up to me uh, in the oil industry that have been there, that have been investing and still investing for the last 30, 40 years. They wanted me to start a hedge fund and raise money because they're looking to buy assets because they believe oil prices are going lower. And that scared me because these are guys who have assets in the oil industry, right, who are going to lose money if oil prices go lower and they think they're going lower because they see all their friends, how leveraged they are. They have hedges on their oil production at over $85 a barrel. Those hedges are going to come off over the next six to 12 months, and we're trading in the 60s right now, which means that these companies are going to be forced to sell their assets. Now, it's a great story to talk about you know, the junk bond market and the debt that these guys take, and it's going to be a catastrophe. It's too premature to talk about that. These companies, and I've visited all the shale areas in the U.S., the Permian, the Eagle Ford, the Bakken, I've been to all these areas with my research team. They own, they spend a lot of money to own prime real estate. Right. Uh, they own prime real estate in this industry. This isn't gold, this isn't silver, where if gold fell $500 an ounce, people would be like, oh wow, you know, not so much of a surprise. It's so hard to value gold or silver. Oil is based on supply and demand. Oil is going to be around for the next 300 years. That's our main supply. And uh, you know, I don't mean to say anything bad about solar and wind, but it's really not even a market when it comes to oil. So <laughs> prices may come down to 40 or $50 a barrel, but they're, all, they're going to be a lot higher five to 10 years from now. And they own prime real estate. I mean, we discovered how to tap shale for oil, which is an amazing technology. That's going to be around forever. When oil prices are right, you're going to see, you know, they're going to turn it up and drill like crazy. When they're low, they're going to cut CapEx a little bit. But that gives the Exxons and the Chevrons who have great balance sheets who missed the shale oil boom right. a reason to go in and buy these assets, which are going to be selling for a lot cheaper. So the fact that they have all these assets, hey, you look at these companies and say, wow, they have $600 million in debt and only $100 million in cash. Those properties that they own are worth a fortune, especially to Exxon Mobil, CVX, who are having trouble uh, replace with their reserve replacement ratio. That's why they're spending $5 billion to drill offshore and build these natural gas projects, and it's a lot cheaper to buy these things in the U.S., and they miss this market. I don't know how, but the majors missed the shale boom market, the shale oil boom market. Now it gives these guys a chance to actually go in and buy these assets when they're going to be a lot cheaper. So I think oil is going to come lower think ExxonMobil, Chevron, companies with the best balance sheets that could buy these assets for cheap are going to be the biggest beneficiaries. So I'd be buying those companies instead of trying to pick away at some of these large shell companies like the Continental, the EOG, the Pioneers that have gone down so much. I'd buy the bigger companies because they're going to be buying up a lot of these assets from these companies over the next 12 months. Right. Well, what's interesting is the same thing for me is that we wanted to have some exposure with that in our hedge fund. And uh, obviously, we missed the opportunity as I took over the management of the hedge fund only several months ago. So the only thing that we could have done at that time prior to the decline in the market was try to buy some Kinder Morgan, for example, and take advantage of the efficiency within the company and how it's basically going to be the toll road of the business. So we think that a company like Kinder can also boost its uh, dividends on a year-on-year basis for the next several years. So I'll definitely take that into consideration, taking a look at like the big oil companies in this uh, recent pullback. So and You're doing a good job with, with Kinder as well, just to yeah. interrupt, but I mean, it's a company that, you know, with 
they have like four or five different entities and they combine to one. If you look at the tax structure, they're saving $2 billion a year just on taxes by doing yes. this, on taxes. So, you know, they're saying that it will increase their CapEx and they'll be able to spend. So that's another company that's going to have a lot of money in their balance sheet to buy a lot of these projects. And Kinder was a company I saw everywhere throughout the shale areas. Again, they like the middleman transportation type things, yep. pay a nice yield. So I'm sure they're going to work as well. Yeah, the only issue with Kinder was the whole capital structure of the company, where there was a lot of concern about the warrants and the expiration price, strike price, which was about $37. But ever since the announcements on the last several quarters about what they're going to do with this whole consolidation, uh, things have started to develop a little bit more to the upside. So we, that's what we've seen, and we've seen recent announcements on the news regarding the pipelines as well. So everything's been relatively positive. So yeah. Yes, there's several ways that you can get this exposure, and I think that for a sector like commodities, it gives the big oil companies the time to basically start to acquire these assets, and, and investors probably can do very well over the next several years. So one of the things I've heard from you is that like you were throughout the whole Balkan shale area. What are your observations? What is the impact do you think that the U.S. is going to have on global oil prices? And how should investors continue to monitor this whole situation? Well, if you look at the Bakken, I think before you even get to the Bakken, you can look at the tar sands, oil sands, and see what impact oil prices are going to have. It's going to hit Canada first, and then the Bakken, which is the highest cost producer outside, or you know, cost the most to produce oil in the Bakken, because the region is a lot different than the Eagle Four, which is a lot easier to drill. You also have pipeline and construction, the Eagle Four, also in the Permian, which they've been you know, drilling in for 50, 60, 70 years already. So all that pipeline structure is, is in effect there where it's more train, rail, and transportation in the Bakken, which costs a little bit more when it comes to the transportation of oil. But you're going to see people cut back in the Bakken. That's why these companies have gotten killed 25, 30%. If you look at the leaders in the Bakken, including Continental, which is by far the biggest uh, they got nailed, and they're talking about Harold Ham and his wife. Who, they got a divorce and everything, and you know, have billions of dollars are worth a lot less now. You know, they got divorced a couple months ago. But it, it's interesting to see because Continental, it's been up so much, Continental, that for me, of course, it looks good. It's a headline story saying, well, you know, he lost four or five billion dollars, but he's made so much money and positioned himself for the rest of his life. And I think oil prices are going to go a lot higher again over the next five to ten years. If they wanted to sell off a little bit of their property to anybody, they could do it right now for a very, very good price, and people would buy it. They're, they have a good structure there at Continental. So and the fact that they're so big, they could produce at a much lower price than some of the other smaller players, which I might be worried about. But uh, it was just an amazing place because it's almost like opening up the first casino in Las Vegas, right? There's nothing there, you know, like right. the Flamingo. It's kind of like when I went to the Bakken. It's dirt roads everywhere. There's no construction. Is man camps, all these like three or four major hotels that you know Halliburton, everybody they booked already for years in advance, and you know it's just amazing that boom going on, how many kids working, but you're gonna see a slowdown, oil prices are lower, but look long term, I mean it is oil, we need it for the rest of our lives. Again, right. uh, you can't commit compare it to gold. You can't compare it to silver. Uh, this is something if you have a five to 10 year outlook, which all the majors do, that's the biggest thing. And I, like I said earlier, I think the best place is going to be Exxon's and Chevron's, the companies with the best balance sheets. And even look for the pioneers and EOGs to go in and start taking over a lot of the competitors in that property. Because there was a rush to buy the prime real estate, which is going to be worth a lot of money. I mean, think New York City, in 2008, 2009, they got hit, not as far as everybody else. And you're looking now, I mean, New York City prices are always going to go higher and higher and higher. That's the way that market is. It's the capital of the world. Any place you go, everybody heard in New York City, they all want to live there from someone who's lived in New York for 37 years. I don't know why anyone has lived in New York City, but that's just me talking from someone who's been there. So the prices are outrageous. But again, when you're buying real estate in that area, you're going to have ups and downs. But overall, in the next 10, 20 years, where do you think New York real estate's going to be? It's the same thing with this real estate. All prices are low right now. A lot of these companies are going to be forced to sell, and there's a ton of money out there that are looking to buy. So it's going to be an interesting period over the next six to 12 months. I think the majors are going and look at companies that have the best balance sheets, the EOGs, and the pioneers. You're going to be able to pick them up at a cheaper price, and they're going to be buying a lot of this real estate as well. You know, Frank, from a paradigm perspective, who'd ever imagined several years ago when everyone was talking about peak oil to think that commodities, for example, would be very much affected by disruptive technology? So you mentioned earlier about the oil sands, and maybe many years ago, the ability to extract crude oil 
oil in that environment was next to impossible. And through innovation and technology, we find a way. Same thing with um, horizontal drilling, for example. Another technological innovation developed in places like America. And its, its impact has been just breathtaking, actually. So, yeah, that's very fascinating. Now, Let's talk about your free agency, Frank. You're a free agent. You have a ton of small cap stocks. Why don't you give the audience some of your best ideas right now since you're not, you don't have a newsletter yet. So this is strictly for the audience on, on what you think is the best ideas. Yeah, these ideas, you know, it's funny because I've always been living with a small cap guy and I follow the markets. And again, I follow so many different stocks, thousands of stocks. Where you look at small cap, I never want to limit myself to small cap. It's just, I took a small cap newsletter at the street. I ran a small cap newsletter at uh, Stansbury. But these two companies are a little bit higher than small cap, nowhere near large cap, but more like mid caps. And I wanted to share these two because it's just two fantastic stories. And the first one is KKR, a private equity firm. And right. this is a company that has the smartest people in the room. It pays a high dividend. It's trading at around 10 times forward earnings. It's a company about, I've owned it. I bought it at 14 uh, uh, about three years ago for my subscribers. I recommended it at $14. And it's 21 today, but it's actually cheaper at 21 than I recommended it at 14 They have a ton of capital. They're growing tremendously. And what I like about them is two things. This, and it's not just buying a high dividend paying stock. They have a lot of growth where they're in Europe right now buying distressed properties. That's right. an area where, and you know as well as I do, individual investors don't have access to that. And you have to really buy into a large hedge fund or, or a private equity fund. This is a way to do it where, you know, Europe's in trouble. A lot of companies are in trouble. You're seeing a slowdown in growth. You know, falling back into recession in all the main areas in Europe. And these guys are out there buying up all these assets. They were buying apartments, which is amazing. KKR, where I visited the Bach in a, a two years ago. They had a, apartment complexes already built in the Bach in, right? I mean, what company is doing that, which is amazing. They're just ahead of every single trend because there's all man camps, there's no hotels, and they're booked forever. I know oil prices come down. It's still going to be a great investment because so many people need to live there. And that was a big problem in North Dakota where people were just going there for two months and going back home. Now they actually have apartment rentals and stuff like that. KKR is buying distressed assets for very, very cheap in Europe. A lot of companies can't do that. Also, their biggest position in the fund is a company called First Data, which they bought at the height of the market in 2007. This company was almost nothing, and they almost wrote it off a couple of years ago. It's growing tremendously right now, First Data. First Data is going to be powering Apple Pay. It's a technology really? behind that. I think Apple Pay is going to be enormous. Uh, they're going to IPO this stock next year, and I think going into that, it, it's going to be a monster stock. Uh, it's growing like crazy right now. First Data is a huge company that operates, I think, in 40 countries have access to 4,000 institutions already, and uh, it really came back a lot. And the fact that these are the guys that Apple chose to really power that technology is a very good catalyst for these guys. They're going to use that. They're going to IPO this next year when it does. There's going to be, a lot of people don't understand that's one of the largest positions in KKR, which is already a big company. When they do, it's going to be a huge benefit. Think Alibaba to Yahoo and how all that hype in Alibaba coming out before it, it even came IPO, where Yahoo mm-hmm. went and Yahoo, how much it went up. It's going to be the same situation with KKR because I expect First Day to be one of the largest IPOs next year as a uh, backdoor way of playing it. So I really like KKR. One more example is uh, Rockwell Automation. Company you don't really hear a lot of. It's trading about 15 times earnings. You know, the market trading 17 times earnings. But it's a great play on something that's called the industrial internet. It's one of the biggest trends in the world. It's got to be for decades to come. If you get a chance, go on GE's website. I don't own GE. GE doesn't pay me to say this. And read about the industrial internet. You're going to start reading about it. Next thing you know, five, ten hours are going to pass, and you're still going to read about it. Basically, what the industrial internet is, is the connectivity of all the machines to the internet through sensors. Now, what does this mean? It impacts every single industry. Planes, locomotives, healthcare, oil wells, how sensors help to track these devices and machines to, to improve productivity, increase safety awareness. So that, you know, if someone comes into, uh, you know, if someone gets hurt and they're in the emergency room, a uh, fingerprint technology could bring up all their information over two seconds. And you know what that does? Well, it helps you treat the patient, but it also lets the doctor treat even more patients, which healthcare companies are going to make more money. Doctors are going to make more, more money. More important, again, doctors get to treat more patients. You're looking at uh, telling us if, if locomotives are damaged so you can fix them before a major problem occurs or derailment occurs. 
So the sensors track all this stuff from planes landing to avoid delays. And again, we all hate delays. For airlines, delays are a lot more worse, and that's probably 10 times worse in terms of setting people up for hotels and giving them vouchers and stuff like that. So sensors are tracking all this stuff and you know, monitoring traffic lights to reduce traffic. And these sensors send millions of data points to computer systems every hour, which is analyzed through algorithms. So this is going to help increase productivity for decades to come in the future of companies. I think Rockwell Automation is a great plan. It's GE sticks market at $30 trillion. That's how big they think this market is. I've been covering trends all my life. I've never seen a number like that, $30 trillion. So everybody's getting into the sensor market. Rockwell Automation's right in the middle. I think it's a great play on the future of the industrial internet where all the machines are going to talk to each other. It's going to help improve quality, improve safety. And uh, I really like Rockwell Automation because I think it's really cheap based on that enormous growth trend. So it's basically the industrial internet into the cloud with big data analytics. Exactly. And they're allying. You know how fast. Look at Union Pacific when you get a chance. Uh, Google Union Pacific and Industrial Internet. And they have 3,000 trains on the tracks at all times. They have sensors all over these things. If boxes fall down, if somebody touches the doors, if they're trying to steal something, if they're on their bearing, so if anything happens with their trains, they know, okay, this train needs to be repaired next time it comes in shop. So now you're not worrying about you know a derailment or something like that, but they're sending millions of data points every single day through this network of trains to improve productivity. What's the fastest way we can get your cargo from A to B, the safest route, productivity, when we need our workers to work, what times is peak and stuff like that. But it's amazing, as you know, if someone who follows the big data trends and how they're analyzing this, the productivity numbers that they're saying are enormous at 20, 30%, which is a huge market right now, in a market where the world is having trouble growing outside the U.S., right? Yeah. Well, you want to get as much productivity uh, to increase earnings the most. So people are going to hire as many, many companies that are doing this, like Rockwell Automations. I just think it's a fantastic trend going forward over the next 10, 20 years and even further than that. Wow, that's very interesting. And yeah. real quick, why does it work now? Why is it such a big trend, as you know as well? Well, prices for the cloud and to store things have come down tremendously to make it, I mean, think about your hard, you could buy a hard drive and, and how much storage you have compared to five years ago right. uh, to analyze all these trends. I mean, it's just cost effective today than it's ever been. And that's why you're seeing this trend really take off. So a real practical example of that is the automated driving automobile. Is that something that fits with the industrial internet and big data? A little bit, but what fits with that, that's more of like internet of everything where you're connecting a device, which is a car, an appliance, or you right. know, outside the mobile phones or tablets. But what you have within that is it's going to track the data points of drivers. That's more the industrial internet where it's going to track, all right, what drivers are coming in at what time is the peak? What's the best time? So all this data is going to be analyzed through sensors, and they're going to be able to track, almost like what IBM does when they have those commercials where you know, a guy's about to rob a convenience store, and the cops are already there. Right. So what they're doing is they're trying to find ways to, to predict the future, which nobody can, but they want to try to provide the statistics that are there, the big data, to, to get an accurate, as accurate as you can to predict the future as you can, and you do that through these sensors and through the industrial internet. I've heard a very um, interesting think bed for IBM discuss about computers and the industrial internet within houses, for example. So in the future, when people are going out to buy houses, they're taking the industrial internet specifications in addition to how many bedrooms does it have, how many square meters does a place have to accommodate one's lifestyle. And at first, it seemed very abstract to think about, but now you're putting in some context into this, Frank, and it seems like this is a real possibility. It's a definite possibility. Again, if you get a chance, you look at GE, look at their website, Industrial Internet, and just start reading about this, how it's going to impact every single industry. Imagine you know, they have a, you know, these sensors on flights. They have them on the, the control towers where you know, they could see if there's anything done with the planes. A lot of times when you get on a plane, you're on a runway, they're like, well, there's something wrong with the plane. You're sitting there for two hours. This is going to be detected much, much earlier where you don't have to worry about that. This way, delays are reduced, again, which is 
a huge expense to airline companies, and we hate it, and I hate it. Everybody complains. Yeah. It's much worse for airlines when these things get delayed. It's it, you know you're having people work on things that yeah you know, again they should be working on new flights and booking new passengers, and they're trying to get all this stuff done. You have people everywhere, chaos. So I mean, just imagine having that and tracking like you know light patterns uh, in terms of traffic lights and stuff where you could reduce traffic just by you know knowing you know keeping a, a light green for an extra thirty seconds. You know that might not be a big deal to a person who's sitting in Ohio right now, but in New York City and Chicago, that's a huge deal during rush hour. So, you know, just these trends to increase productivity, get people in their homes maybe half an hour earlier. What are you going to do at that time? Whether you work, you spend time with your family, the benefits are just going to be enormous. And it's hard to measure on a spreadsheet. But when you start reading about this, it's fascinating to where they're actually taking it and to how, and how many industries and how many conferences in the industrial internet are coming up where they're being sponsored by AT&T, Cisco, all the major companies are going uh, all in on this trend right now. I just think it's going to be huge. Isn't a more simpleton strategy towards all of this just buying Apple at the end of the day, considering how they're able to convey various different products to the consumer that can still try to produce the results of the industrial internet? No, because Apple's a hardware company, as much as you want it. And, and even Rockwell Automations, this is about 10, 15% of their revenues, and they want to make it 50, 60, 70%. It's almost like Cisco. It's almost like IBM. Okay. IBM talked about big data. However, the rest of their business, which, which applies to 75% of their revenue, is slow. If you look at Cisco, when you look at the Internet of Everything, they say it's going to be a $19 trillion trend. Is Cisco right. the best plan on it? No, because they're a router and switches company that accounts for 70%, 65 to 70% of the revenue, and that's barely growing at 1%. So Cisco's not the best plan is because they're so big. The better plays are maybe the nuts and bolts like the Skywork networks mm-hmm. that build the parts for these companies, uh, Nuance Communications, and AN, which has uh, voice recognition software, which if you think in every single car, your appliances, I mean, I've been to the Consumer Electronics Show where you walk into these uh, major uh, you know, house displays where you say, you know, make me coffee and, and turn on the computer and you know, put on the radio and stuff and voice, that's Nuance technology who does all that. So even the better plays, those companies are going to be much better beneficiaries. And even look at a chart at Skyworks, and they're talking about how big the Internet of Everything is, where Cisco is also talking about it, but they still have a core business that's struggling, and they're just so big. So I don't know if Apple would be the best play on that, because, again, they make their money by selling iPhones, and they're getting into the software, the technology, the data right. tracking, Apple Pay. We understand the watch and everything, but I don't know if that's the best play in terms of it's such a big stock, and I don't know if you're going to get to 20 30% gains, but Rockwell Automations, I think, could easily double and triple from here three years to 10 years out. Definitely. Yeah, I was actually referring to more simpleton strategy or approach, at least to capture some components of that trend. Trend, considering we know so many mm-hmm. of the audience might be invested in Apple in some shape or form. Well, Frank, you got to get going soon, but how about let's um, cap this interview by mm-hmm. having a very retrospective question for you, which is basically, you've talked to so many people, you've been doing this for years, you've been doing interviews for about the last 10 years, and you've talked to the brightest minds within the industry. What have you been able to collectively gather that could provide in investors in edge or traders in edge to capturing capital gains within the market? Uh, capture capital gains within the market. I mean, you basically have to see what stocks that these people are recommending and your guests recommending. But I, I mean, there's two sets of questions there. There's one, how could investors capitalize Listen to these guys' ideas because when we do have podcasts, which is really cool, is and you're going to have this as well, and you're talking to me for whatever it is, 20 minutes, a half an hour, you're going to be able to talk to whatever it is, Muhammad Alari and Jim Kramer, some of the best market experts, for like 20 minutes where you don't get that in the media. You don't get that in CNBC. They're like, explain inflation and deflation. You got two minutes before the commercial break. Right. You know, I want to listen to these guys for 20, 30 minutes, and that's the advantage of these podcasts where they come on, they share their ideas. It's a really cool format and everybody gets to listen these podcasts are for free for me that for and the other question is for the biggest takeaway for me is when you're interviewing these guys they become contacts for life and since i've been doing this for 10 years i'm sure you're going to do this for 10 20 years 
these are guys that you can rely on because you don't know everything. And, you know, a lot of people believe they do and they want to have their egos. But someone who's been in this industry for 20 years, there's experts in technology. There's experts in mining. There's experts in every single field that you want to talk to, that you want to be friends with. Before you're recommending your stocks, I want to call a Rick Rules if I'm going to recommend a mining stock because he's been doing it for 40 years and financing companies. And he'll tell me, this is a great management team. These guys are cool. Here's what you have to talk to. Things, even as an analyst, as someone who's been covering these industries for 20 years, that I don't have access to. So you're going to have access to that. The more guests you have on, you're going to talk to brilliant minds, and it's just going to increase your network, and it's going to improve your network just for the regular folks out there that are listening because everybody's a professional at something. I'm a believer of that. I mean, our job is to follow the markets all the time, but you're going to get guys that work in specific industries that are going to email you, kids from college that are going to email you the biggest trends in the world. And that network is priceless. And I think that's going to be really good for you going forward. So any rules of thumbs that you've managed to extract from all your conversations with everyone about investing or trading? Any rules? The rule, yeah, there's one rule you should follow that no one rule works. <laughs> Everybody will use it. That's the rule you should follow. And I mean that because it's easy for a newsletter writer. You want to be able to sell, say, if you do this and you do this, this is what you're going to make. That never, ever happens. And it's funny because when you have a system that works and a system that's good, everybody wants to follow it at the same time. And when they do try to follow it at the same time, what does that do? That usually puts a lot of money into that trade and results in, in even worse performance later on. So there's not one rule that works. I think you have to adapt to the markets, especially today. People think the market's expensive. It's not expensive when you have low interest rates, which is a fundamental change in the market where there's right. not really too many places you can invest. So I would just take all the knowledge that you know and then filter it in and try to come up with your own style. So what you're saying is basically... Even though there might be certain market inefficiencies, since more players start to participate in it, that efficiency closes and that becomes a much more efficient opportunity, meaning that people are, exactly. that are following the opportunity might not be able to capture from that gain. Exactly. I mean, look, if you look at the housing market and see the collateral debt obligations, the CEO market, it was a fantastic market until every single investment firm piled on and kept piling on. Then you went to the subprime market uh, and then look what happened. Everybody knows now with the housing crisis. But it was a good trade when so many people pile on the same good idea. You have to be careful because nothing works all of the time. If it did, everybody would use it. So be able to adjust your styles. And by interviewing a lot of people, you're going to get different styles where it's technical, where it's fundamental, bottom up, uh, top-down approaches, and I think you have to find what's good for you, use all that information, and then come up with how you're going to buy stocks, and, and, and you know, I think it's just a fantastic way of looking at it. Well, thank you very much, Frank, for being the first guest of the show. I hope to talk to you sometime soon, and hope to appear on your show sometime in the not-too-distant future as well. Absolutely. It's an honor, and good luck with everything. If you ever need anything, just give me a shout. Thanks, Frank. Take care. All right. So what did you think? Imagine getting a perspective on what it's like to work with Jim Cramer on a daily basis or producing research for the world's largest independent research company. Frank also gave some interesting themes such as the oil shale boom and how to invest in an environment where the price of crude oil is correcting. And we also talked about the industrial internet and how big of a theme that is going to be in the upcoming years. What he also provided was a discussion about the power of networks. And I hope that you can utilize this show, which will introduce my network as your network, so you can use these ideas to generate your own investing themes going forward in the future. So over the next year, I'm going to bring in a lot more of my friends, and I hope we can try to understand and develop new paradigms that will help us become better investors. Thank you very much. Looking forward to talking to you soon. We hope you enjoyed this mastermind session. If you'd like to contact Peter Pham or Phoenix Capital, please email info at phx-cap.com.